Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Sri Lanka and the coverage of the conflict. The Tamil Tigers and the media up against the forces of government. We're now 300 meters away from the Tamil Tiger line. Gaza and the war fought over new media. The dream job and the unlikely applicant. And the dentist had the boy in stitches, then the boy did the same to us. No. Welcome back. It's a familiar storyline. Government forces move against what they call the forces of terrorism and then lock the media out of the war zone for so-called security reasons. This isn't Gaza we're talking about. We'll get to that later. It's Sri Lanka. As the Sri Lankan government tightens its grip on northern strongholds long held by the Tamil Tiger rebel movement, the media are being subjected to censorship, intimidation, and news blackouts. The head of Sri Lanka's state-funded broadcaster has called on the media to, quote, restore peace and harmony, unquote. And the stakes are high. A leading editor of an opposition newspaper has been murdered, and international news channels find themselves threatened with expulsion from the island unless they play by the rules. Our starting point this week, Sri Lanka, the media, and the struggle to tell both sides of the story. Mayatharu Mulatiu Palamantalam Mohudu Pradeshi Yatra Akramintibu, LTT Boatu Dekakata Navikam Dava. Sri Lanka has been in an on and off state of civil war since 1983. However, the story is more difficult to cover now than ever. We're now 300 meters away from the Tamil Tiger lines. I started covering Sri Lankan war in 1992. Uh, I had tremendous access. I was allowed to go into prisons and film Tamil prisoners. I interviewed the, uh, the army chief of staff. I was allowed to go on the Tamil Tiger side. That's changed. We're restricted. The nightmare situation. The media are not just restricted. They have been threatened. For anyone who disagrees with official opinion, these are dangerous times. International news networks, including Al Jazeera, BBC and CNN, have all been put on notice by the Sri Lankan government. The country's defense secretary warned the networks that they would be chased away if their reporting gave the Tamil rebels what he called a second breath of life. The minister issued the threat just days after this interview with the BBC. Does that mean you think that uh, dissent or criticism during a time of war is treason? Yes, because I have only two groups, you know, that is the people who wants to fight terrorism and the terrorists, two groups. Either you are a terrorist or either you are a person who's fighting the terrorists. As George Bush said, you're either with us or against us. <laughs> this is how another government minister explained the policy. I think the BBC suggested to the Secretary of Defense that he was like George Bush. Now, I may not want to be compared to George Bush, but the fact that America was attacked by terrorists and had to defend itself must be understood. And you have to take special measures for these things. The conflict in Sri Lanka... Those measures include making it more difficult for the international media to get accredited to report from Sri Lanka. The country is still in a state of war. Those that do are banned by the Sri Lankan government from traveling into the north where most of the fighting is unless they're embedded with government troops. We're literally a few hundred meters away from Tamil Tiger positions. Some journalists are very brave and some people have gone up. We have taken people up and they report as they like. I mean, Al Jazeera people were taken up by us. The BBC guy was taken up to Jaffna. They don't say only what the government wants. So it's not that we're trying to muscle people. And the government is using censorship. BBC World Service Radio, which is broadcast through Sri Lankan FM stations, has had its programs interfered with in an almost comical way. Some parts of the program where we are reporting on the Sri Lankan war, mostly, they normally lower our audio and they would play some music or something else on that. On one occasion, they also played uh, the cricket commentary between Sri Lanka and India. As a result, the BBC's World Service suspended its FM broadcasts. It can still be heard in Sri Lanka, but only via shortwave. The international media have been harassed. The Sri Lankan media have it much worse. As we reported last month on The Listening Post, MTV, a private TV station owned by a Tamil, was attacked, its equipment destroyed by armed gunmen. That came after the state-funded channel accused private media of irresponsible reporting. Then, Lasantha Wickramatunga, a newspaper editor, was shot dead in his car. 
He was the 14th journalist killed in Sri Lanka in the last three years. So many have been killed and nobody has been brought to justice, which is another problem we have with the Sri Lankan government in this situation. We want them to prosecute the murderers of journalists with the same enthusiasm as they would prosecute the murderer of a politician or a, a military person or anybody else, and they don't do this. As a result, journalists have been leaving Sri Lanka in droves, some fearing for their independence, others for their lives. We caught up with one of them, Sunanda Deshapriya, in the South Indian city of Chennai. For the last three years that we have been at war, uh, nearly 50 journalists have left the country. Uh, that's mainly Tamil journalists. And now government has openly said that dissent in times of war is treason. If you try to be independent and get uh, you know, real voices from the people, and uh, you get threats and you, are, uh, you get all the kind of pressures uh, not to do that. After a quarter century of civil war, the fighting has intensified, but the coverage has fallen off. In a way, Sri Lanka is reminiscent of the recent Israeli war on Gaza. Governments that say they're out to eradicate enemies that they call terrorists lock out the media and control the story. Israel has kept Gaza completely closed to journalists. Instead, they're controlling what we can film and who we can talk to. This is what journalists mainly have to rely on for information from the war zone. Official briefings with photographs and facts and figures provided by the military. I think governments around the world are learning that, uh, you know, in order to um, channel the news that you want, then you must control the media. It seems to be a trend in conflicts now to shut out the media. It's become almost uh, par for the course now that whichever side you're involved in only wants their side of the story told. And the intolerance exhibited when you try to tell both sides is quite palpable and quite worrying. What you have is completely self-censored media, either Tamil or Sinhalese or English. I do not think that people really get independent information to make informed judgments on what's happening in the north and east of the country. And that, the evidence would suggest, is just how the Sri Lankan government wants it. Here's how our Global Village voices see the media clampdown in Sri Lanka. The media is not allowed to have even a slightly critical opinion of the government. And any such opinion is viewed as supporting the Tigers and the such media personnel are killed. There is no press freedom whatsoever in Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka is acting like a perfect rogue state. We don't see any Sri Lanka, local Sri Lankan media giving out news. It's not there on the website, it's not there on TV. We always have to depend on international media so the local perspective gets lost in the whole process. Media freedom is only a phrase in Sri Lanka, a phrase without substance. Given the current climate of media repression, is the world hearing the real story? In short, no. How can it? The handful of journalists that used to report the truth to the people of the country have had to flee the country, and those who are left fear for their own lives every day. The president last week has asked journalists to report responsibly. What does this mean? Simply put, follow the government line and exercise self-censorship or suffer the consequences. Anyone looking to be one of our Global Village Voices can either email us at listeningpost at aljazeera.net or just go on Facebook and look for the Listening Post page. We'll let you know via Facebook what stories we're working on and how you can get with the program and contribute to our broadcast. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. 2008 was one of the bloodiest on record for reporters, and 2009 is shaping up as a lethal year as well. According to the International Federation of Journalists, more than 100 media workers were killed last year, with Iraq remaining the deadliest place in the world to report from. Among the latest journalistic casualties, Somali radio editor Saeed Talil Ahmed, who was shot and killed in Mogadishu. Ahmed worked for Horn Afrique, a Somali-language TV and radio station. He's the 13th Somali reporter killed in the last two years. The credit crunch has taken a big bite out of Rupert Murdoch and his global media empire, News Corp. Murdoch's New York-based company reports losses of more than $6 billion after a huge write-down of its assets. News Corp owns the Fox News Network, online networking site MySpace, and the Wall Street Journal, amongst many others. News Corp blames declining ad revenue and book sales for the losses, and the company's profits are predicted to drop by 30% in the coming year.
A group of financial editors from some of the UK's biggest news outlets have found themselves in the middle of a story that they were covering, the global economic crisis. British members of Parliament grilled the editors of BBC Business, the Financial Times, the Daily Mail and the Guardian to establish if their reporting had a negative effect on financial institutions. One of the journalists then turned the tables on the government. Simon Jenkins of The Guardian told the committee that the government used the media to drive down the share prices of banks in order to lower the cost to the taxpayer of nationalizing those banks. Online activists in Egypt are making a mockery of the Mubarak government's case against blogger Mohammed Adel. Adel was arrested last year and could face terrorism-related charges because of photos that allegedly show Adel holding a machine gun during a visit to Gaza. Adele's supporters accuse the government of fabricating the pictures and to make their point they have posted photos of themselves holding toy guns. They call themselves ironically bloggers for terrorism and hope that their solidarity campaign results in Adele's release. Tourism officials in Australia were advertising what they described as the world's best job, to be the caretaker of a tropical island off the coast of Queensland. The winning candidate would get to live on the island for free, explore the reef and post a weekly video blog. But they weren't counting on this application. A prankster hijacked some video of Osama bin Laden, garbled the audio, threw up some subtitles in which the applicant claimed to have experience with videos, delegating tasks and large-scale event coordination. We're back after the break with a story on online video and the war on Gaza, how both sides use the web to push their brand of propaganda.